Good morning. If there is anyone out there that doesn't know me, my name's Lois Passy. Uh, and you're probably wondering why there was a reading about enemies after we just saw Sandy's cute little dog and <laughs> we're celebrating animals today. Certainly not that her dog is our enemy. <laughs> It'll become clear in a moment how these two things are linked. Many of us love animals. Those of us with pets often find comfort in their affectionate manner, in their touch of their fur, for example. Even those of us who aren't nuts about having a pet still think of their innocence and admire their contribution to human happiness. Um, I'm told, unfortunately, I wasn't here a couple of weeks ago, but we had a, a pet named Piper who was uh, quite um, popular with the congregation. <laughs> um, so we are here to honor these pets and to honor and support mostly mutts. We're grateful for people who care for animals and who, that are neglected or abused. People like those who volunteer for mostly mutts. They work very hard, deal with difficult situations, and facilitate relationships between animals and humans. When we think about a place like mostly mutts or the Humane Society, we think about the animals. We think of how cute they are, how loyal they are, how innocent, and how wounded they are when someone hurts them. But we don't think much about the human being who hurt or neglected the animal. If we think about the abuser at all, we think of him or her negatively. We don't like them. How could they have done this? Once we are done criticizing them, we turn our attention quickly back to the animal because that is where we put our love. There are several problems with this. For starters, it's a violation of two of our principles. The first principle states that we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. Like it or not, that includes people who have done terrible things. Their inherent worth isn't touched by anything they do, no matter how heinous. To affirm their inherent worth isn't to say that we condone their actions. As a matter of fact, I would suggest that seeing their inherent worth compels us to help them find their true identity again to live out their true worthy nature. The seventh principle refers to the interdependent web of existence of which we are all a part. To focus on animals while ignoring the human side of the equation is to ignore that principle. The answer to problems of human interaction with other species is not to shun humans. Being a UU isn't easy. If we are using our UU identity to think of ourselves as superior because we don't have a rigid theology, or because we are progressive, or because we fight for the rights of others, we're making a mistake. Being a UU is hard work. It's less about changing others and more about looking at ourselves. We all struggle with this. It's only human. We pride ourselves in being universalists, in being open to all kinds of beliefs, and in being champions of the rights of others, especially those who are oppressed. And before we know it, while we are criticizing the politically or religiously conservative folks down the road, we are being equally smug about our own convictions feeling good that we are so much more open. We're just not open to people who aren't open. <laughs> and last but not least, we don't admit to ourselves what we're doing. We don't admit that we have become as deeply entrenched 
in our ideas as they have become in theirs. So we need to go at this differently. Instead of looking outward, we start by looking inward. We begin to notice our judgments. We all have them. We become aware of our reactions. We gently confront ourselves. How do we feel about people who won't issue a marriage license to gays? Are they ignorant jerks? Are they fearful, misled, practicing their religion with deep conviction? Many years ago, I worked in a foster care prevention program. A client named Maria came to me involuntarily after beating her teenage son. She was a tough woman. She used to begin every session with the words, Ms. Lois, I ain't in no mood. <laughs> and I adopted that, that phrase, and so sometimes I'll say to my kids, I ain't in no mood. <laughs> Instead of judging her, by the grace of God, I had the wisdom in that moment to be curious about her. I respectfully asked her why she beat her son. She explained to me that he was running out into the streets each night, hanging with other kids who were in trouble with the law, even gangs. She didn't want him to join a gang. She thought she could beat it out of him. It would be better to beat him than to lose him to a gang. I was able to frame her actions as loving. She loved her son so much that she would do anything to keep him from getting in trouble with the law or being killed in the process of living with gang members. When I was able to reflect that to her, she softened a little. She was more open when I suggested that we needed to find a different way to help her to protect her son. I had to see a loving mother before I could make any difference. If I had tried to change an uncaring, awful person, I would have failed. Why? Because that person doesn't exist. There was no uncaring person to change. She cared deeply about her son. I had to work with the person that was really there, the loving mother. Seeing the inherent worth of a person gives us the final destination of our work, the restoration of that awareness in the other. It sets our sight on a goal. Imagine getting in your car and driving around aimlessly or turning on your GPS and not setting it for a destination. Obviously, you would get nowhere. Or imagine setting it for the wrong destination. For example, putting in the right city but the wrong state. Or as I did maybe a few months ago, I was trying to find a Catholic church in Danville on the 1 Montgomery Street I was at a Catholic church on 1 Montgomery Street that was all locked up. It turned out I was in the wrong city, about two miles off. <laughs> that is what it is like to try to change someone or a group of people without having the final destination in sight. The final destination is the person whose birthright is a worth beyond measure. We must set our internal GPS toward that destination. So getting back to those who abuse animals, no matter what the abuser says, we can be sure that he or she does not think much of themselves. For example, if someone beats a dog, no matter how much noise they make about how bad the dog is, deep down, they feel more awful about themselves than they did before they beat the dog. Each heinous act reinforces the sense of self-loathing. 
Back in July, Kathy Hummel talked about the typical cycle that abusers and their domestic partners experience. They lose control, beat their partners, deeply regret it, try to make up, and before you know it, the whole cycle starts again. When they feel remorse, it's real. They feel horrible. Their better nature is coming through, and they can't stand what they did. They are full of shame. We can bet that they don't see their inherent worth and dignity. They equate their worth with their actions, so if their actions are heinous, they hate themselves. And here's the worst part. People who hate themselves can't face what they hate. Instead of looking at the part of themselves they hate and owning it, they project their hatred onto others. Instead of admitting how much they hate themselves, they beat the dog again. This only makes them hate themselves more, and the cycle continues. And I know in this example I'm talking about you know, something as bad as abusing an animal or abusing another person, kind of the more extreme uh, spec part of the spectrum of things that go wrong. But really, we can look at these concepts even within our own lives at the minor infractions that we occur. If we snap at somebody, for example, the same thing is happening. Perhaps the first step in that person's healing is for someone in this world to hold a mirror in front of them that reflects their inherent worth, to help them see that although their actions are wrong, they are prized beyond words. There is only one way to hold up such a mirror for someone. We can only do it if we see their worth. Our seeing is their mirror. They may not be consciously aware that we see their inherent worth, but something feels different. For a moment they feel safe. Something in them relaxes in your presence, and they may even be able to express their pain to you. Just like Maria, the healing can only begin at the moment that I heal myself from my own criticism and hatred. My perception of someone's worth is an act of love that opens the door for healing. Many years ago, shortly after I graduated from social work school, I worked briefly for a foster care prevention program in Brooklyn. Salvador Mnuchin, a famous family therapist, came to our agency. I remember he said, uh, the reason I came here is because I like to work with hopeless situations. <laughs> and he wasn't speaking about our clients. <laughs> People presented their cases to him, and one young woman stood up and began to talk about her, quote, needy client, mentioning all of the client's deficits. For most people, her presentation would elicit pity how could she possibly help someone so awful? However, Salvador Mnuchin had a different response. He said, I know you lie. The reason I know that you lie is because you don't include yourself in the problem. He said that 30 years ago, and I've never forgotten it. When we talk about an abuser, or a right-wing extremist or a terrorist expounding on all of their awful actions. It is a radical thing to say that we lie when we don't include ourselves in our thoughts. But we you use are accustomed to being radical, so let's have at it, let's be radical. <laughs> the question we can ask ourselves is, do we pit ourselves against the abuser claiming to be on the right side of the conflict? Or do we put ourselves on the side of the abuser with the goal of bringing him or her back to the full awareness of their worth and dignity? 
If being right means standing against the person, we are not right. That is not the work of peace. If we wish to save the dogs, we must help the humans. And if we wish to help the humans, we must take a radical view of those humans. Seeing inherent worth in every person is radical. Jesus saw that worth in prostitutes and tax collectors. Martin Luther King Jr. saw that worth in white racists and Gandhi saw it in the British. We can see it too. Every week we light a candle for peace. I would like to offer a meditation as we light that candle. Peace does not begin with changing anything outside of me. It begins with changing my mind about those who I wrongly believe to be my enemies. What happens after that is anyone's guess. But when it comes from the right place, it will be the right action, an action that leads to peace. Blessed be.